So if we look at Gideon then, along with the people of Israel, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now notice this. God could see them. God could see them misbehaving, but they couldn't see God. They misbehaved in front of God who was watching them. But they couldn't behave properly because they couldn't see God. Now, I don't know if I prefer the difference. What if God couldn't see us, but we could see Him? I don't think a whole lot of benefit there, is it? I'd rather have God watching over me than me watching over God. Because guess who doesn't need a whole lot of watching over? <laughs> right? So, the children are doing bad in the sight of the Lord again. And the hand of the Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which were in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midian came down and the Amalekites and the children of the east even they came up against them, and they encamped against them, and destroyed the increase of the earth, till they could come together unto Gaza, and left no substance for Israel, neither sheep, nor oxen, nor asses. And they would come up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for a multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Pretty standard. When do you pray? When you have a problem. Does God want you to pray? Yes, He does. So what does He give you? A problem. He brings a problem to them. Now the Midianites, again, remember, usually the people who are giving them problems are relatives. Moses married a Midianite. Remember? Her dad was the priest of Midian. Now the Midianites, who have some relation to them, and maybe that's why they encouraged them to come down, Moses had gone a long time. Nobody has seen God do anything in 40 years. <coughs> they might talk about what he did with Eric and what he did with Deborah. But was that really miraculous? That was 40 years ago. What do you remember 40 years ago? And with what detail do you recall that? For me, I was 20 years old. And I look back now, and maybe some of those things weren't quite so miraculous. Right? <laughs> so, Gideon's life, and I read this to you, it, we meet Gideon in the midst of problems. Now, here's the thing. When you're in trouble as a Christian, there's probably other Christians in the same problem around you. When America is in trouble, we suffer too. Gideon was a good man. But when Israel was suffering, as God was raining down punishment upon Israel, it affected Gideon as well. When the Midianites came in, we find Gideon hiding from them. Remember, the Midianites were coming in, they were stealing all the grain and all the cattle. They were just coming through from one end to the other and taking everything. So Gideon was a smart guy. He had this wine press. It's a big old vat where they would stomp grapes. Well, about that high, Gideon had thrown his feet into this big box. And he would go inside where people couldn't see him. And that's where he would thresh his feet. He would be on his hands and knees and he'd be beating his feet so that it would be calm flour. And he would do it inside this. So if anybody came by, they would just see this big empty bowl. 
the big old empty wine press. No grapes, no wire, so they weren't <coughs> looking for anything because he had no vineyard. What he did have, though, was his sweet dumped in the bottom of the sink, and by hand he was pulverizing it. Smart. So he's down here in this wine press working on this wheat, and guess who should come to see him? An angel. We're introduced to the angel of the Lord. Now what's important about the angel of the Lord? When you hear the term, the angel of the Lord. Look at verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him. In the Old Testament, when you see the term, when it ever has the article, the, usually it will say an angel appeared. But when it says the angel of the Lord, that's Jesus in the Old Testament. So Gideon, wow, he is visited by none other than the Son of God. Jesus himself in the Old Testament, before he was born, before he was a man, while he was still in his godly form, he comes down and visits Gideon. And Gideon recognizes him as the captive or the angel of the Lord. This is, and it's important to note, it, this is Jesus. It shows us even before he got here, he was very much interested in the plan of salvation and working it out and making sure that what was supposed to happen does happen. These poor Midianites had no idea who they're dealing with. And so he comes on and the angel of the Lord appeared to him <coughs> and said unto him, The Lord is with thee. Same thing that the angel Gabriel said to Mary. The Lord is with thee. Important. God is on your side. When the world is against you and the Midianites are taking everybody's food, it's good to know that, hey, God's on your side. Doesn't look like it. I mean, if God was with me and God's on my side, how come I don't have anything? How come I just saw the Midianites came through our neighborhood and take everything if God's on our side? Sometimes God being on our side doesn't really amount to much at that moment. Sometimes when we're going through a hard time, and people want to encourage us. They say good things to us. But at that particular moment, I don't care to hear their good things. Right? I'd rather have them explain to me if things are so good and so great, then how come I'm in this mess? That's usually how people address these things. So here we have Gideon hiding now in this wine vat pounding out the wheat and making it into flour on the ground so nobody could see him, hiding what little flour he could get to make bread for his family, and hoping that the Midianites don't take the little that he had. He can't make a lot. can't make enough for his friends and family. He's got to just make enough for his own. Our daily bread is part of what he's consuming. Make it enough for today. He's not thinking about making enough for weeks. He's making enough for today. He can make a little bit at a time. He can scrape together enough flour to make a loaf of bread. And it takes him all day's work to do that. Because of the way he has to do it. And the Lord is with thee, the angel said. Because it's hard to believe Gideon is going to ask for proof. I want to know that this is true. I want to know that you really are a messenger from God. How do I know that what you're saying is true? <coughs> well, Gideon and the angel had gone into Gideon's house. Gideon invited him to stay for dinner. The angel stayed for dinner. Gideon made the bread and had whatever he could for dinner. 
invites the angel into his house. The angel comes in. How do I know? So the angel steps into the fire and disappears. Okay. Somebody comes to visit me. And my granddaughter says to me, Grandpa, Jesus told me to say this to you. Why are you wicked old man? You ought to change your way. And I say, baby girl, how do I know you're supposed to be talking to your grandfather? She says, Jesus told me to say, you wicked old man, change your way. Right? And take me to the store and buy me something. What? So she gets in the fire and disappears. And reappears back in her own home. I'm getting in my car, I'm driving over to her house, I'm picking her up, and I'm taking her to the store because God said it. Right? Gideon's impressed. But here's the problem. You know what the problem with a miracle is? It doesn't last. It doesn't last. Gideon, you know, that wasn't the, 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 the miracle you were expecting to hear, right? Because you know the one about the police. And I mean, you get to that one yet. When Gideon first meets the angel, he asks for proof. Later, when Gideon's involved in his warfare, he asks for proof. Again, how do I know? And he'll ask for a second proof. And a third one. The problem with miracles is miracles have to keep being reproduced. Because miracles don't build faith. Faith might produce a miracle. But a miracle will never produce faith. People ate the bread and the fishes. And what did they say the next day? What miracle will you do today to prove to us? Excuse me, were you not here on the mountain yesterday? Did I not take five small loaves and two fishes? And with that, did I not feed 5,000 men plus the women and children? Did you? Yeah, but that was yesterday. What are you going to do today? Paralytic comes down. Jesus reaches over and heals him. Paralyzed man, everybody knows he's been, he was carried in by four men. They brought him on his bed. They lay him in front of Jesus. Jesus says, your sins are forgiven you. The Pharisees, wait, you can't say your sins are forgiven. Jesus said, well, what's easier for me to say to this man? Should I say to him, your sins are forgiven you? Or is it easier for me to say to him, rise up, take up your bed and walk? Well, because of your heart, sir, would you take up your bed and go home? And paralyze. Yeah, I know that for you. Sure. He hops up, takes up his bed and walks up the door. And they said, what sign will you do that you're qualified to do that? Signs do not produce faith. That's why in years past, the signs movement, the Pentecostal movement, which is all based on signs, right? I have to have a sign today, guess what? I'll have to have a sign tomorrow. No signs are given, Jesus said, to this adulterous and wicked generation. No sign will be given to you except the sign of Jonah. Remember the man from hell who said, Lord, would you send someone from the dead to talk to my family so that they won't come to this place? He said, if they don't listen to the, if they don't listen to uh, Moses, and if they don't listen to the prophets, they won't listen even if somebody came up from the dead. If this book does not inspire faith, no sign of it. Because the greatest of all power is the word of God. And if we accept God's word, then we have all power is given unto us in heaven and in earth. If we don't accept this book as the authority and we look for another, we find nothing. We're constantly looking for the next and the next and the next. And if what you're looking for is miracles, you'll need one today and you'll need one tomorrow. And you'll need one the day after that and the day after that. Because miracles do not produce faith. But faith can produce a miracle. So Gideon now has gone into his house. The angel has vanished. 
Wow, it was the Word of God. All right. He's inspired by what the angel has said. His dad is a worshiper of Baal. In the Old Testament, when you saw Baal, B-A-A-L, there were a lot of things that followed after. Baal, Peor, Baal this, Baal that. Baal is the devil. Beals is above. The Lord of the Flies. Okay? So, Beals above, or Baal, Zebub, just another name. And most of the gods uh, surrounding Israel, their gods all began with the first name Baal. <coughs> so, Gideon, excited, gets up in the morning, goes out and destroys his father's altar. And instead builds an altar to Israel. In Israel, he builds an altar to Jehovah. And everybody in Israel is mad at him. They should have known. They just had Barak and Ezra. They just had Othniel. They just had miracles take place. Why didn't it settle in? Because science don't deliver faith. So here we are back at it again. They go off. He crushes it. His dad, though, gets it. His dad understands what his son was saying. And his dad defends him. And then Gideon now, charged up by this, blows a trumpet and asks the army, the men of Israel, to form an army and we're going to fight the Midianites. God said we would have a great victory over the Midianites. He tells everybody that. We're going to beat these guys. God met with me. God said the Midianites are as well as destroyed already. I'm going to fight against them for you. I just need you to gather up an army so I've got something in my hand to use when I defeat the Midianites for you. Everybody listens to Gideon. He tells them the story about the angel and how he came into his house, how they had some bread, and how the man stepped into the fire. Woo! Like that, he was disappeared. Everybody's listening. Gideon, they can tell from the excitement in his voice that it must have happened. His dad is dead there behind him, although he tore up my altar. I believe that we need to change and go back to the God of Israel. All right, let's follow Gideon. Gideon's all excited. I'm going to get myself an army. 32,000 men show up on his door. We're going to follow you and we're going to get rid of you. God doesn't need 32,000, but wow, what an army. 32,000 men were going to fight against the Midianites. And God says to Gideon, that's too many. Get rid of 22,000 of them. Don't need that name. Hey, fellas, God, remember I told you God's going to do the fighting. So I need mean, all of you who don't really want to be here, if you have second thoughts, you don't want to be here, God said you can go home. Hey, God said I can go home. And he won't hold it again me. Off they go. He's got 10,000 people standing there. <coughs> God says to Gideon, He's still got too many people. Take him down by the river and let him drink some water. And the people who drink water with a watchful eye, keep them. But everybody else who throws down their weapon and licks up the water like a dog, send them all home. Guess what everybody does? They lick up the water like a dog. Except for a couple of hundred. Now I got like 300 guys. I had 32,000. Didn't I look good? I mean, if I'm going to be a general, why don't I be the general of a big army? If I'm going to be the pastor of a church, why don't I be the pastor of a big church? If I'm going to be the grandfather of a family, why don't I be the grandfather of a big family? Right? If I'm going to have grandkids, I might as well have grandkids all the way up and down the street. Why not big, big, big? That's what everybody thinks. But God kept saying, too big, too big. Churches nowadays have gotten so big that they don't do anything for God. Except be big. But what are they accomplishing? We're not changing our world. We're not changing our neighborhood. You'd figure what 10,000 Christian people in a neighborhood like this get out of change the neighborhood. But they don't. The neighborhoods are no different than ours. 
got that big man in church. You got 25,000 people, 50,000 people, 100,000 people. You had to buy a stadium in Texas to hold all your people. But what are you doing? God said that's too many people. Get rid of them. Get rid of them. Too many people. Finally, he's got 300. And God says, you know what? With 300 men, I can beat them beating them. Why? Because who was supposed to get the glory? Was Israel? No. Or was God? The church today isn't as much interested in God getting the glory as we are. You ever notice that ministries are always named after the man? Who gets the glory? The man. It's his ministry. And it really is his ministry. It isn't the ministry of Jesus Christ. It's his first. And then Jesus gets stacked in there when it comes time to take an offering. Oh, Peter Popoff, you don't know about Jesus, you know about Peter Popoff. And give him your $10,000 so that God will multiply it and give you back $100,000. Right? Their ministries bear their name because that's who they're promoting. Gideon had that same idea. I could be the general of 32,000 men. No, you can't. All right, I could be the general of 10,000 men. I don't have a problem with that. No, I'll tell you what. How about you not be a general? How about if I just make you a captain and give you 300 men? I was ready to be a king. I was ready to be a general, at least a colonel, but no, just a captain. And only 300 men? Yeah. <sighs> Off Gideon goes because God had talked to him. So they're getting ready for the big fight. And what does Gideon do again? Something that we often do. <laughs> Gideon was telling everybody that God was talking to him. But now is the night of the battle. Gideon, you have to go down into the enemy's camp tonight. Hmm. Are you sure that's you talking? <laughs> Are you sure I have to go down into the camp? Are you sure I just can't send my children into the camp? Are you sure I can't send my granddaughter and have her go into the camp? I'll go. No, you have to go. But it's dangerous out there. Yeah, remember I said I was with you? Yeah, about that. About that. You know you haven't really done anything in a while. So here, here, I'm going to give you a chance, God. <coughs> I've got this fleece, this lamb's wool. I'm going to lay it on the ground. And if you're really talking, because maybe it's just me hearing the wind, and I'm thinking it's you. The wind got pretty specific, though, when you said it, man, that was invented. And then it got pretty specific when it says that they laugh like dogs. Get rid of them too. It sounded rather like it was very, very specific, but now he's beginning to have second thoughts. So what does he need? He needs another miracle. When times get tough, you need another miracle. So here's the deal. I want the fleece to be dry and the ground to be wet all around. But I want the fleece to be well, if you know anything about condensation, it doesn't work that way. When fog moves in, it gets everything there. But the fog has to roll in in the form of a square and not touch it up. <laughs> so, he gets up in the morning, he goes to the fleece, and sure enough, the fleece is dry, but the ground is wet all around. Should go get the people now and leave them to battle. But remember, Gideon, you have to go into the enemy's camp. Yeah, about that. How sure are you? All right, all right. Last, but maybe that was a fluke. Maybe accidentally the fleet stayed dry somehow. So here's what I want you to do tonight. 
I want the fleece to be wet, but I want the ground to be dry all around me. Then I'll know it's really you talking. Yeah, right? So, but God obliges. And in the morning he comes out, and sure enough, the ground is all dry, the fleece is wet. And God says, all right, enough of that now. Go to your job. Gideon goes in, here's what I want you to do. Harry wants you to have a trumpet. I want you to have a pitcher with a candle inside the pitcher. And when I tell you to, I want you to break the pitcher, let the light shine, and then blow the horn. As you're running into the camp. Shouldn't we be swinging a sword? No, you'd be pretty busy breaking that. <laughs> Remember, who's doing the fighting? Yeah, but, let me ask you this. Do any of the enemies see God? No. They never see God either. If they don't see God, they might see Gideon. Which means they're all going to be pretty angry at me for coming in the middle of the night screaming, hollering, and breaking the lamp open. And somebody might want to stab me. It's one thing if God's in front of me, but if God's invisible, they can pass right through him and still get me. Gideon's got a lot of thinking he's doing here. He's already asked for a miracle from God. He got two of them. He's ready to invade in the camp, but God keeps saying, I'm doing the fighting. I'm doing the fighting. Don't take your sword just yet. Once you get in the camp, plenty of time. A couple of things about a fleece. This is stuff before we get to the battle. There's, a, I suppose, a temptation on all of our parts to pull out the fleece roof. Whenever we're scared, we want to say, Lord, do this, and then I'll know. The problem is, if you did it, just like you didn't, you can want a second one. Because maybe you didn't pray for this part. Someone would ask me, what do I think about a fleece? Sometimes I think they're okay. For example, there are some things that the Bible isn't real specific about. Uh, when my wife and I were called to this church, I knew I was called into the ministry, but nowhere in the Bible does it say, I'm calling you to South Euclid Baptist Church. It doesn't say that. So I might be tempted to say, Lord, I need you to be a little bit more specific about where I'm going. Especially, maybe I had a couple of choices. I could go here, or I could go here, or I could go there. Maybe they're all three looking at the same time, and they all three look about the same. It might be practical on my part, maybe, to attempt the flute. However, when the Bible is very specific, you're not allowed to use a fleece, one, to go against it, or two, even to confirm it. Does it not put you in the same position as the devil? Lord, you see all these kingdoms? Bow down and worship me. That was the least. I'll give them all to you. They might be given. They might be saved. Uh, Lord, I know you're hungry. Why don't you turn these stones into bread and not a fleece? The devil's offering him a fleece. Don't take it. Sometimes we're the devil tempting God. And that Jesus said, tempt not the Lord your God. For example, the Bible is very clear that I'm supposed to share my testimony with people. Whosoever will may come. I am required to share with anybody who asks me about the reason of the hope within me. I have a commandment from the Word of God to tell me that. So, someone comes up and says to me, Pastor, would you tell me about Jesus? Wait, i got to get out my old fleece. Lord, do you want me to talk to this person about Jesus or not? Can't do it. Why? There's already a biblical command that I'm supposed to do. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get the Bible to go against itself with an idol punch. So you can't use a fleece when it directly contradicts 
but the Bible is already laid out. All we can do is admit we don't want to do it. But we can't use a fleece to sort of bolster ourselves up. But in areas where there is no specific answer about a specific situation, it might, when there it seems to be no clear rule, you might sometimes try, I would make it my regular way of doing things, but you might from time to time try the least. But make sure it doesn't contradict what the Bible says, and make sure there's not already a specific rule or law, a commandment in the book to do something, and you're trying to get out of it. You keep some big, big deal about that point, okay? <coughs> so Gideon and his fleece, but did it really encourage him a whole lot? No. That's what I was saying. Miracles do not give you faith. But sometimes your faith can get you a miracle. Sometimes in trusting the Lord, when good common sense says maybe I shouldn't, like going down into the enemies, but God said I should. And God was pretty specific, didn't he? He talked to him and said, you're going, in, you're going into the camp of the Midianites. They are camped right over here. Follow me. Okay, you're going to go along this way, and then you're going to run down that alleyway, and then you're going to break the land and you get halfway there. That's all pretty specific stuff. There's nothing there to say, well, what are you talking about? What do you want me to do? God's really laying it out very clear. The plan of salvation God lays out very clear. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Anyway, trust that. Right? So Gideon then, running down now because God said to go, and it's that night he got his fleece, so now he's got no reason not to. Goes down, breaks, has his candle inside of a pitcher. What kind of weapon is that? Here there are a hundred thousand, a hundred thousand minions armed with shields and spears and swords and knives and you name it, and they got all the latest artillery of their day. Alright, first of all, I don't want a hundred thousand of you. I only want three hundred. And on uh, second thought, I want you to carry a picture. Yeah, you don't want a picture. Oh, and put a candle inside the pitcher. Yeah, make sure it's not a glass pitcher, not something you can see through. Make sure it's one of the clay pots so that no one can see what's inside. And put a candle inside. What? That's how you're going to win. Wait, let's go back to that fleece again. Because what you're saying makes no sense. God said I was, he was going to fight the battle. How come there's not some giant angel that come up in the front? Could we see him? Again. Guess what? God's will be for your faith. Will you believe God if he told you something as crazy as put a candle in a pitcher and you're going to want a battle? So as they're running down, sure enough, they break the pitcher. They all shout, Sword of the Lord and of Gideon, and they blow their trumpets. And the enemy jump up. They see all these lights. They think they're surrounded. And they run into each other's doors. Was God down in the camp? Did anybody see God that night? But when the battle was done, did God win the great victory? They look around and there's everybody stabbing each other. All your enemies took themselves out. They jumped up out of bed, grabbed their sword, and ran right into their neighbor. That was God. But when you were looking at it, you couldn't see God, though. Now, after it's all done, it's easy enough to say, oh, you see what God did? No, I didn't actually see it, but I could see the result. We're always looking for God's footprint while the action's going on. And God, like I said, doesn't leave the footprint. However, when the work is all done, you can look around and see that God had been there. There's evidence. Because remember, faith will always leave some concrete evidence. Right? Even, and God, 
He's as concrete as they come. You might not see him. You might not see his feet and his imprints left in the earth. <coughs> but when you wake up after that battle, you'll know, wow, those guys didn't kill each other. God killed them. And he killed 100,000. And we got to be part of it by breaking the lamp and saying, sort of the Lord. And to get in. Sometimes it's a proper place for a fleece, but sometimes it's just good old fashioned faith. Sometimes faith asks us to do things that don't make any sense. It doesn't make sense to get rid of 10,000 people. Or it doesn't make sense to get rid of 22,000 people. And then it makes even less sense to get rid of another 10,000 people. And when you're going to war with 100,000 men, don't you want to have at least 100,000 of your own? But since God was going to fight the war, 32,000 would be plenty of big enough army. That was too big. I want a small number. I want a small number. Nobody wants a small number. Everybody thought for sure that God was going to be working in the large. But he didn't. God often works in the small, even in the one. Some of the greatest men that the church has ever known came out of very small churches. Sometimes it was just a family church, a couple of people in there. Some of the greatest men came out of that. Lots and lots and lots of people might be changed by that one. But we're all looking for the big. We're looking for God to make thunder when he walks. That would be neat. At least I know where he was. Right? But he does. He came to Gideon and said to Gideon, Oh, mighty man of valor, this is a man hiding in a big wine press. But how do I know you're really the angel? What can an angel do to prove to you that he's an angel? Scare you? Or step into a fire that's here? First miracle. That was enough for him to tell his friend that he spoke with an angel. The angel said that God's on our side and we're going to win great victory. But when it came to the night of actually carrying it out, I need another miracle. And because you asked me to go tomorrow, I need another miracle. Miracles require another miracle. Faith can give you a miracle. But a miracle cannot give you faith. That's what we learned from Gideon. 